it's been a different morning for sure. It's been a different morning uh, all the way around. And, uh, but I believe this. I believe God's going to speak to us this morning. And I'm excited about the word that he has for us. This is a message that's been brewing in me for weeks. And I'm super excited to be able to share it this morning. So I know you guys are ready to sit down, but I'm going to ask you to bear with me just one moment as we read this text together. The verse we're going to be honing in on this morning is Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. It's going to be on the screens in a moment. And some of you I know are going to recognize this verse because you've probably heard it before. It says this. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future. And I, I love this verse. How many of you heard that verse before? Have I mean, you heard that verse before? Yeah. If you've been around church, uh, or maybe if you, if you haven't been around church, you've probably heard this verse. Maybe you've seen it printed on a t-shirt. Maybe you've seen it on a coffee mug or one of those fancy things you see at Hobby Lobby that you can take home for half price on the weekend. And so, or if you got your coupon, you can always get 40% off. I know that all too well because we spend too much money at Hobby Lobby. But you can find this verse printed all over the place. And as I was preparing for this message several weeks ago, maybe even months ago, I asked God, I said, I need you to, I need you to show me what you want to tell your people. I need you to show me what you want me to say, because I don't know what to say. And, uh, but he does, and he, I felt the Spirit tell me this. He said, I need you to go to your Bible app, and I need you to go to your history of all the things you've highlighted, and I need you just to read until I tell you to stop. And so I did that. I started reading all these verses going backwards in my timeline of all the things that I had highlighted and all the things that I had read. And I came to Jeremiah chapter 29, but it wasn't Jeremiah 29, 11 that I had highlighted. It's verses four, or starting at verse four through verse seven. And this is where God spoke and said, this is it, <laughs> this is it. And I didn't even, hadn't opened a commentary, I hadn't opened, you know, a, a Bible dictionary, I hadn't opened any of the resources that we as pastors and preachers use to prepare our messages. But I felt God say, there's something in here. I just need you to dig in. I need you to press in. I'm going to show you something. And he did. And so this morning, I want to read you the verses that I read. And it starts in verse 4. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Anytime, anytime you open God's word and it says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, you better pay attention. You better pay attention. If God's speaking, you better listen. And he said this, to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters into marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to read your word. God, thank you that it's alive and it's active and it's moving and it's speaking to hearts even right now. Just like you spoke to me when I read this several weeks ago, God, I pray that right now you speak through this text, God. I pray that you speak through me, that you give me the words that your spirit wants to say today. God, would you move? These aren't my words, these are your words, God. We give you this time. God, would you speak? And would you be in it? And we promise to give you all the praise and the glory. Amen. Amen. You guys can take a seat. If you're sitting by somebody, tap them on the shoulder and say, this is going to be good. Again, it's not good because of what anything that I've prepared. It's never about me. It's never about Pastor Richie or any person that's on this platform. It's about Jesus. 
and it's about what God wants to say. And so I can say that in confidence, that this is going to be good, because I've already had it working in my spirit. And as I began to read these verses several weeks ago, like I said, I rem- don't even remember really why I highlighted these verses months and months ago. And maybe it was because God knew that months down the road, he was going to want to speak. And so he needed me to highlight it. So then when I went back, I would find it. And so when I read these verses, there was one word really that, that stuck out to me in this passage that when I got to it, it kind of rang a bell. And I don't know if it rang a bell with you when we just read it a minute ago. But it said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile. And I read that word, exile. I was like, man, just rang a bell. Because I don't know about you, but I take a look at the, the world around me and everything that's going on. And it seems that every day we wake up to a world that was different than we knew even the day before. But definitely it was different than what we remember in November of 2019. Can we, can we all agree that the world we live in is a little bit different now than it was last year? The way we thought 2020 was going to play out didn't play out at all the way we thought it was going to play out. And so as I read this word exile, it made me think, man, it seems like, it seems like I'm living in exile in a world that's foreign to me, that's strange to me. Sometimes I feel like I don't even know the, what to do in the world that I live in anymore. And that's where you, the Israelites found themselves at. And so we can look at the world around us and it's, it's just different. We got people wearing masks and things over their face that Hey, I don't remember anybody in 2019 wearing face mask other than my doctor, maybe. But now everybody seems to have one, and it matches their outfit. It's got their favorite team on it, and you get got different shapes. Some of them cover pretty much the whole face. Some of them have the, the plastic shield. You know what I'm talking about, the plastic shield. I saw someone that they had the plastic shield, and they had the face mask underneath it and everything but the hazmat suit. They were ready. They were ready for whatever life was going to throw at them that day. And so, man, it's just different. It's just different when we go out. Shopping is different. Eating at restaurants is different. Some of our favorite restaurants we can't even go into. Some of them have shut down. It's just, it's different. You can't sit in a booth that connects to somebody else's booth. You can't high five the person sitting next to you as you eat dinner or you eat lunch. You have to be spaced out away from them. You can't go to the movies. Anybody else miss the theaters, miss going to the movies? I know Richie does. He's got his hand up. He, he loves movies. I do too. That was always Christina and I's favorite thing to do on date night. And now we're like, what do we do? You know? And so I guess we could you know, pop some popcorn at the house and watch it on our TV, I guess. But man, theaters are closing because nobody wants to go back. There's no sporting events. Man, this is the first summer probably in at least a decade that I haven't been to a Braves game and multiple Braves games. Man, I missed that. I missed that this year. I missed the the hot dogs. I missed the cheering on the Braves. And man, what, what awesome year they had, and it was disappointing not to be able to be there and support them. And so, man, I hope sporting events come back at some point. Hopefully they don't take the same path as the theaters, and everybody's like, well, I'll just watch them at home. You know, hopefully we can get back and cheer on our favorite sports team. I mean, church is different, right? Church feels different. We can't, it feels weird. Do I shake the hand? Do I not shake the hand? Do I give the high five? Do I air high five from seven feet away? Or, you know, what, what do I do? You know, do, do I talk to this person? You know, I don't know. And, and I know we've had these colored bands that people wear and they're like, oh, is it, is it, are they green? No, they're yellow. I, I don't know what yellow does. I don't know what to do. You know, oh, it's red. I better stay away from them. I'm not going to sit in their section. Um, and so it's just, it's weird. Like the world we live in, it feels like we're foreigners in a strange land. And that's where the Israelites and the nation of Israel found themselves in. And it said that God had sent them and carried them into exile. It said that in verse four. Let's read it again. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile. It didn't say they wandered there. It didn't say they somehow just woke up one day and they were in exile. No, God, it says he carried them into exile exile. He did it on purpose. He had a reason behind it. And so God sometimes puts us in uncomfortable situations. God sometimes puts us in situations that 
aren't always easy to navigate. And, and sometimes he walks us through seasons of seemingly like we're in exile. But notice what God told them after he carried them into exile. Um, if we have these verses, I don't know if they're in order, but I want to go back and I just want to read it. It said, he told them, he said, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so they, they too may have sons and daughters. He said to increase in number, do not decrease. What God was telling them here was, I need you to settle down. I need you to settle down. And that's because this wasn't going to be a temporary stay. This wasn't going to be a week-long vacation in Babylon. No, they weren't getting a hotel room. They weren't even getting a six-month term on an apartment. No, they needed to build houses and settle down because you're going to be here for a while. I need you to start families. I need you to put down roots. I need you to get a job. I need you to get settled right where I have you. And what God was telling them is I need you to be faithful where you are. I need you to be faithful where you are. See, God doesn't promise us that we'll never walk through seasons or times of uncertainty. Life's going to be full of seasons of uncertainty and times where we're uncomfortable. There's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. There's going to be mountains. There's going to be valleys. There's going to be everything in between. But God doesn't promise us when we come to faith in Christ and when we start following Jesus that life's going to be, you know, unicorns and rainbows. It's going to probably be the opposite. There's going to be trials. There's going to be struggle. But God says, I'm right there with you. I know where you are. I haven't forgotten about you. My promises are still true. I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but plans to give you a future and to give you a hope. So if you're here this morning and you're looking at your circumstances around you, if you're looking at the situation that you're in and you're like, man, this is uncomfortable, I want to get out of this, maybe God's telling you, I just need you to settle down, I just need you to be faithful right where I have you. And we don't know when all of this is going to be over. I mean, we could be here for a long time. Our world, our world could not go back to normal ever, honestly. We just need to learn to be faithful where God has us at the moment and know that he knows the plans that he has for us. He's not trying to harm us. He's trying to prosper us. He's going to give us a future, and he's going to give us a hope. All we need to do is stay faithful. And what we need to remember is not to let our situation dictate our surrender. We don't need to let the situation that we're in dictate our surrender. See, a lot of us, when we walk through times that are uncertain or uncomfortable, we let that situation dictate how willing we are to surrender and to serve. But God says, just because you're uncomfortable doesn't give you permission to be unfaithful. Just because life around you is uncertain and it's uncomfortable, that doesn't give you permission to be unfaithful. He said, no, where you are is where I have you, and I have you there for a purpose. And what I need you to do is settle down. I need you to settle in and, and get comfortable with being uncomfortable, and I need you to be faithful right where I have you. I need you to be faithful, and I know I got one woo. We're not getting many woos this morning because some of us are like, I want to know when this is going to be over. I want to know when life's going to go back to normal. I want to know when the theater is going to open and when my job is going to come back and when I can finally leave the house. But we need to know that even though we're uncomfortable, God's called us to be faithful. He's called us to be faithful in the midst of it. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on. In verse 7, it says, also, he's got something else for us to do. Not only does he want us to be faithful, but he's got something else for us to do. He says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So not only is God telling us to be faithful where we are, and be faithful in the circumstances he has us in. He says, I need you to change the way you're responding to your circumstances. I need you to change the way you respond. And he tells them to seek the peace and the prosperity of the city, to pray to the Lord for it. See, it's one thing to just settle in and settle down in a place that you're uncomfortable, but it's another thing entirely to 
pray and to not complain about things that are happening around you, but to pray. And see, a lot of us, especially when it comes to maybe even political things, we, we want to so often complain and maybe we go on to Facebook and we want to post our thoughts about it. But when's the last time you stopped and you actually prayed about what's going on? And maybe we're on different sides. Maybe there's differing opinions on even political things, but that doesn't mean we can't pray for things that are happening around us. God says to seek the peace and to pray to the Lord for it, even if you're in a place that's not your own, even if it's a place that's uncomfortable, maybe if, even if things that are going on around you aren't quite what you would want to see happen and, and see done, maybe things are playing out differently than the way you would do it, but instead of complaining about it, pray about it. Instead of posting about it, pray about it. Pray about it. That's what God's saying to do here. I remember several weeks ago when we were going to the, the polls to vote, I got a text from uh, Aaron Freeman. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call her out. She's in our small group. She was also leading worship up here this morning with Dan. And we got a text. Our small group did. And it said this. It said, hey, what do you guys think about getting together tonight? This is the night of the election. And just praying about the results of the election. And I was like, man, what an awesome <laughs> approach to things. We're not getting together to complain. We're not getting together to just soak, our, soak in our tears and our sorrow of maybe how things are playing out or not playing out the way we wanted to. No, we're getting together and we're gonna pray and surrender this to God because God's in control. And so we did that. We, we weren't actually able to get together in person, but we got back on Google Hangouts and we all came together and, and we prayed for the results. Whatever happens, God, would you have your way? God, would you move in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of chaos and confusion? God, would you move? Would you have your way? Whatever you want to do, God, we're surrendering it to you. And God is telling us that no matter where you find yourself, seek the peace and blessing of those that are around you. Maybe, maybe you're in an uncomfortable spot at work, and you just need, instead of complaining about that person that works next to you or works with you on the night shift, maybe you need to pray for them. Maybe you need to pray for them. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's a relative. Maybe it's somebody you ate dinner with Thursday night that just rubs you the wrong way. You know, we've all got those people, right? People we love but we don't like. You know, maybe you need to pray for them. Maybe you need to pray for him. God's saying, seek the peace. Don't add to the chaos. Be a part of the solution. And see, a lot of times, some of us, we're happy to serve, and we're happy to do our part when everything is going wrong, right. But the moment things start going bad, we seem to forget the promises of God. We seem to forget those things that he's promised us in his word. We seem to forget those things that he's told us time and time again. And we're, it's all well and good. We'll, we'll sing the songs when things are going well. But when things start to look bad, it seems like God is the last thing that we go to in those moments. And that's why I love that moment we had earlier singing, I will praise you before the breakthrough. I'm not going to praise you after the breakthrough, God. I'm going to praise you before it happens. In the midst of uncertainty, in the middle of the chaos, I'm going to give you praise. And so we have to serve even when we're uncomfortable and we can't forget the promises of God. If we keep reading in Jeremiah 29 and verse 10, it says, this is what the Lord says again. The Lord is speaking. We need to pay attention. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Did anybody notice how long they were going to be there? 70 years. And some of you are like, I hope this isn't a prophetic moment where you're speaking. COVID's going to be here 70 years. I hope not. 
But even if it does last for 70 years, God tells us, I need you to be faithful right in the middle of it. Stop complaining about it and settle in and be faithful right where I have you despite what's going on around you. And he says, I'll come to you. He gives us a promise. He gave his people a promise. He says, I'll come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. How many of you glad that we serve a God that gives us a promise that he's going to come through? Can we just give him praise this morning? There might be seasons of uncertainty. There might be seasons of struggle and seasons of exile. There might be times where I'm called to literally walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But God's given us a promise. He said, I'm going to be right there with you in the middle of it. You're not going to walk through it alone. I'm going to be right there with you. And when the time is right, when the time is right, and I know timing, my timing is always perfect, he says. When, when the timing is right, I'm going to bring you back. And the same God that brings us into seasons of uncertainty, into seasons of exile, he's the same God that brings us back out of it on the other side. It's not a different God. It's not a different thing. It's the same God that puts us in those situations. It's the same God that's going to bring us out on the other side. It says, I will come to you and fulfill my good purpose to bring you back to this place. And then verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I know the plans I have for you. He knows the plans. I, Growing up, I, uh, I read the King James Version. I grew up in one of those churches, right, where it was just KJV only. We didn't go anywhere else. Richie knows what I'm talking about. We joke about this all the time. KJV was the version of the Bible we read, but I love, I love what the King James says in its translation. It says this. It says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I love that God not only thinks of his people, but his thoughts are toward us. His thoughts are on our side. He's not just thinking about us. His thoughts are toward us. It's in our favor. He's in our corner. He's on our side. Psalm 40 verse 5 says this. It says, you have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Psalm 139 verse 17 says, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. His thoughts are toward us. Even in seasons of uncertainty, even in seasons of struggle, his thoughts are toward us. His promises are true. And when we're afraid and we fear what the future holds, he tells us not to fear. He tells us not to fear. He says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. I know the plans I have for you. I know you don't understand it. I know it doesn't make sense. It's hard for you to comprehend. It might seem chaotic. It might seem confusing, but I'm not confused because I'm in control. He says, I am in control of the situation. I know where you're at. I know the thoughts I think toward you. I know the plans I have for you, and my plans aren't to harm you. My plans are to help you and to give you a future and to give you a hope. His thoughts are are toward us. So church, we don't need to fear the future. We don't need to fear the future. We need to go from fear to faith. We need to stay faithful in the midst of the circumstances that we found our, find ourselves in. God calls us to be faithful in those times. How many of you were ever scared of the dark? Maybe you're still scared of the dark. How many of you ever scared of the dark when you were a kid? And some of you are like, I don't know, I don't know. And so some of us are scared of the dark. It's okay. It's okay to be honest in church. We don't want to lie in church, amen? And so Charlotte, our two-year-old, she went through a season several months ago where every night, like clockwork, it was like she would wake up terrified. I mean, if you've ever had kids and you have a kid that's terrified, that's a different kind of cry. That's a different kind of cry. It terrifies me to hear it. And so she would wake up in the middle of the night just terrified because either she saw something that really wasn't there or maybe it was a bad dream or maybe, you know, she forgot mom and dad 
were present, well, whatever it is, she would just wake up terrified. She would just be screaming, screaming at the top of her lungs. And I'd run in there and pick her up. And right when I pick her up, she settles down. She settles down, and we'll turn the little, the little nightlight on, and then she can see that mom and dad are there, and everything's okay. Her fear disappears. Her fear goes away. You know why kids are scared of the dark? Maybe you know why some adults are scared of the dark. <laughs> because you can't see. You can't see clearly. Maybe you think that something is there that's not there. Or maybe, you know, you don't, you don't see that which you think should be there. This is the dark causes confusion. There's, there's unknown in the darkness. There's uncomfortableness in the darkness. I've asked the, uh, the tech team to help us out with something this morning, so I'm going to ask them to help me out this morning. And this might get a little uncomfortable, but it's going to be okay. You guys ready? Anybody else uncomfortable? I don't know where the edge of the stage is. I'm not going to move. But I have to move because I need to find the other part of my illustration here. I've literally got my hand out in front of me because I'm trying to find my platform. There it is. I found it. When we're in darkness, it gets uncomfortable. Anybody else got a little bit of anxiety this morning? They're like, this is weird. This is uncomfortable. Why are we doing this? The people watching us online, they're probably like, what is happening? It's just a black screen. Did someone hit the wrong button? What's going on? No, this is intentional. See, darkness causes confusion. It causes us to question what's going on around us. But just like our kids, when they're scared of the dark, when you go in and you turn a light on, it, we see a little bit clearer. So I'm going to turn my light on. And when we turn a light on, we start to shed a little bit of literal light on the situation. When we turn a light on, things get a little bit less daunting, a little bit less scary. And just like Charlotte, when I go into the room and we turn the little light on and she sees that mom and dad are there, then she calms down because everything's all right. So when we turn a light on in the darkness, things get a little bit clearer. Now it doesn't completely illuminate and clearly give definition to everything going on around us, but it does shine a little bit of light around us so we can navigate. We can navigate a little bit more. And here's the truth. God's given us a light. God's given us a light. We just have to turn it on and pay attention. Psalms 119 says this. It says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. God's given us a light. God's given us a way to navigate in the darkness. We just have to turn it on. And notice this in that verse. Put that verse back up one more second. It says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. A lamp does not illuminate everything. A lamp just illuminates enough right in front of you to take another step. And I think the words of the psalmist here are intentional. They're intentional when he wrote this, that God's word doesn't tell us everything. It, it's, not, it's not a... a, a, a a ball that you, a crystal ball that you can just see the future. No, it's, it's a lamp into my feet. It's a light to my path. And so when I'm in seasons of uncertainty, when I'm in the unknown, I can literally in my hand, I know I've got my phone in my hand and I've got my flashlight on, but God's literally put his word in our hand. You could use the Bible app, you could use a paper copy of scripture, it doesn't matter, but God's given you his word, he's given you his promises in, in your hand to light your path, to be a lamp unto your feet, 
And so when you're worried about what's going on in the world around me, all you have to do is open your phone. Psalm 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let's take a step. Let's move forward. I'm feeling alone and abandoned. Deuteronomy 31, 8 says, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Let's take a step. Feeling anxious and I'm overwhelmed. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Let's take a step. Let's maybe take two steps because we know that he's with us. If we're feeling uncertain about the future, Philippians 1, 6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 21, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future if we look to God's word we can walk we can navigate the darkness we can make our way around he's not going to tell us everything that's going to happen in the future I feel like if he did that we would probably get a little bit scared we would never take the next step he says no I'm going to give you my word in your hands so you can take one step and then you can take the next step and you can take another step and after that you can take another step and you can just keep moving You can be faithful where you are. I know it might be uncomfortable. I know it might feel awkward, but I am with you. My word is literally in your hand. You live in a a generation and and a day and time where you have God's word at your fingertips at all times. But how many times, how many times do we take this device in our hands and we open every other app we open every other app we can get our fingers on except for the one that lights the path before us some of us today we need to switch our app we need to switch the app that you're looking at Here, here's the thing I was talking with Kenny this morning when we were preparing for this if we turn this light off If we turn off the lamp to our feet and the light to our path, and all we have is this light that's looking back at us in our face, look at where the attention is. Look what's illuminated, it's me. And how, how many of you know, like when you get a light that's shining in your face, it's even harder to see in the darkness. It's just like that car coming down the highway and they got their bright lights on. It makes it really hard to see where you're going because you're so focused on the light that's shining at your face. You're so focused on Facebook or you're so focused on Snapchat or you're so focused on your text messages. You're so focused on everything else except for that which lights your path. Switch your app. Switch your app. Here's the thing, when we turn on a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, when we all participate, when we all turn our lights on, we can start to see the world in a different light. That which was uncertain, that which was scary, And uncomfortable gets a little less uncomfortable. I know some of you spend a lot of time on your phones in church, and I'm going to ask you to put that to good use right now. Can we pull out our phones? I know you got one. Turn that light on. Turn that light on. Let your light shine. See, when we, as the church, shine our lights in the darkness it's a little brighter it gets a little brighter it starts to shed some light on the situation but if you're so focused on that light being focused on yourself it's not going to do any good 
you got to let that light shine. And let others see it. Jesus said that we're a city on a hill. And he put us on a hill because that way everybody can see it. And so when your coworkers are wondering, why are you not worried? Why are you not afraid of what's going on? You're like, I've got a light that lights my way. I've got a light and a lamp to my feet that lights my path. And you know what, church? When we all start to use that light, when we all start to shine our light, you know what we get? The church. We get the church. The church isn't this. The church isn't this room. The church happens when we get up and we walk out of those doors and we get in our cars and we go back to our jobs tomorrow morning and we go back to our families. That's what church is. That's what church is. And some of us today need to stop posting lies and we need to start shining God's light. And no, I'm, this isn't a message against Facebook. It's not a message against Instagram. Those things are useful. We use them as the church. But when they distract us, when they distract us and when they cause more fear, then they cause faith. We've got it backwards. We need to switch our app. We need to focus on what God says. We need to focus on what he says in his word. And when we all start to shine our light, man, this looks good. And this is just an illustration. That's right. That's right. Hold that light up. When we all start to shine our lights, the world gets a little brighter. Y'all keep those lights up. I'm going to close this out here. Y'all provide the light this morning. We don't need this building. We can have church, even in the darkness. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. As I started to dig into this passage, like I said, God said, stop here. I've got something for you. And as I started to read, as I started to study, what I found was this. God sent his people into exile. He sent them away from the city that they knew, the place that they knew. He sent them away from their homes. He put them in an uncomfortable situation, and he gave them a promise. He said, when 70 years is up, I'm going to bring you back, but I need you to stay there 70 years. I need you to stay there 70 years. And when they went into exile, the temple, the place that they worshiped was destroyed. And then they were scattered. And when the temple was destroyed, when they were scattered and they went to their new homes and they set up new places and put down roots in those places that he told them to put roots down, they had to establish a new way of worship. They had to establish a new way because when they were in Jerusalem, they all just went to the temple. They all just gathered there. But when God sent them into exile, they had to establish places of worship wherever they were. And those places were called synagogues. And this is where the synagogue became a thing. And if you know your Bible, if you're familiar with scripture, we know that the apostle Paul spread the gospel in the New Testament through the synagogue. But see, the apostle Paul could have never accomplished that which God put him out there to accomplish if the Israelites had never gone into exile in the first place. That which they knew as their form of worship was destroyed and God sent his people out in preparation for what was to come, in preparation for Jesus, in preparation for the gospel. He knew that all along. So when he wrote Jeremiah 29, 11, and he said, for I know the plans I have for you, not plans to harm you. I know right now being scattered and being uncomfortable and being in chaos and confusion, I know it seems that I'm trying to harm you, but I'm not. I'm not trying to harm you. I'm trying to bless you. I've got a future and I've got a hope for you, but the future and the hope that they thought was coming 
didn't come. The future and the hope was Jesus. The future and the hope was the church and the spreading of the gospel. And I don't know why we're not clapping right now, but that's why he sent him into exile in the first place. Is to prepare for the gospel. We are here today literally because of that. That's how the gospel went to the Gentiles. Because his people were scattered. His people were scattered. Can I get a little bit of light? We're going to close this thing down. Every eye closed. Every head bowed. I don't know what God's saying to you right now. I know he's speaking to hearts and he's speaking to lives because there's a lot of us that we're walking through this world that we live in and we're looking for answers in all the wrong places when all along we've got a literal light to our feet and a lamp to our path in our hand. We just need to surrender to God's will and God's way. We just need to surrender whatever his plan is, whatever it is he's trying to do. I don't know what that is. His word doesn't say that. It doesn't tell us everything. It just says, I need you to be faithful. I need you to be faithful where you are. I need you to change the way you respond to your circumstances. I need you to lean in. I need you to press in to my word because I know the plans I have for you. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you, to bless you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. Who's to say, church, that God's not preparing for something great in the midst of what we're walking through? I know it seems like we're scattered. I know it seems like there's a lot of confusion and unknown. And I know it's uncomfortable. But I believe that God is going to do something great, not just through Avalon Church, but through the church. We just have to remain faithful and focused on that which matters. Focused on his word, what God is telling us. God, we thank you today that you have given us a promise. We thank you that you've given us your word. And so God, we surrender everything that's happening around us. We turn our fear into you, we surrender it to you, and we say, God, would you give us faith? whatever your plan is, whatever it is you're trying to do in the church, whatever it is you're trying to do in our lives, whatever you're trying to do in our family, in the midst of chaos and confusion, God, we surrender to you. God, would you speak to us? Would you let us know that you're with us? God, would you do a work? Would you do a work? Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.